try that again. Good morning. Uh, thank you for those scripture readings today. We're going to look at some of those uh, verses and see what God is saying during this time of Advent. It's good to be with you. Um, I love that song, In the Bleak Midwinter, where we come from. Um, it's in the middle of summer right now, and this last week in Sydney, they had their hottest week in 54 years. And everybody that was emailing us was uh, envious of the cooler weather that we were having here. Um, so it's good to hear that song. Just checking to make sure the technology is here with us today. I want to begin to end my sermon today with a prayer that I've been using during this season of Advent. It is in the prayer book, Take Our Moments and Our Days, an Anabaptist prayer book. And recently, this prayer book was released as a free app that you can download onto your phone. And this particular prayer has been used every morning during Advent, and I found it to be very apropos. So those who can see the screen behind me, if you'll join me in this prayer. Incarnate God, holding tenderly all things human, you became one of us. Lighten our hearts with Mary's vision of your just mercy, that we may be gentled into joining you in the hard and holy work of releasing peace on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Advent scripture readings have a message that gets repeated. God is breaking into this world, so you'd better wake up and get ready. Jesus' first appearance, his second coming in the future, and his continually coming into our world upsets the way things are and brings change. And many of us are not comfortable with change. I talked about this new app. Um, I just recently joined the iPhone uh, generation. Uh, in my family, they would say I came over to the dark side and finally got a, an iPhone. And um, I'm slow to change, and I'm slow with a lot of technology. And my wife and kids were very proud of me that I was able to download this app all by myself onto my phone. <laughs> the other thing is, I still use this. Uh, in Australia, we'd call this a diary. Um, here, they might call it a, a date book or a calendar. And um, Mary and I work together all the time, and so all of our work, all of our notes uh, for us, for meetings go in this book. Now in here is an orange pen. When I open this book up and the orange pen is not there, we are close to chaos. My universe runs around that orange pen being in this calendar, in this diary. Usually I find it on Mary's desk. But until then, I'm not dealing well with change, and I'm not dealing well with chaos. Mary threatened to steal the pen this morning and, and upset me even when she found out I was, I was going to tell that story. But when Mary and Isaiah are singing and talking about change, it's much greater disruption than my displaced pen. When God appears, things change, and those who in Amos' words are at ease in Zion, or today at ease in Lancaster, or Elkhart, or Sydney, Australia, or Harrisonburg, Virginia, those who are at ease in Zion should expect to see their world shaken. In Isaiah's words, those who mourn in Zion, those who are on the bottom of the social heap, will be given bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of, of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit, 
They'll rebuild the old ruins, raise a new city out of the wreckage. They'll start over on the ruined cities, take the rubble left behind and make it new. Mary's song in Luke 1 is full of scriptural references. It echoes the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2, where Hannah prays, My heart exalts in the Lord. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. Yahweh raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Now, Mary's song is not a sugary, sweet Christmas song that we're often used to, but a revolutionary anthem, a song of freedom. It is the longest speech placed on the lips of any woman in the whole New Testament. God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Mary is putting into song the hope of Israel. Finally, God is going to come down and do something. God is going to turn things upside down. The poor will be on top and the powerful will be brought down. The proud will eat humble pie and the rich will have empty pockets or maybe go to jail for defrauding others. God is coming good on the promise of old. Isaiah's vision will come true and the poor will hear good news. Now we're used to the idea of Mary's pregnancy being a scandal. But we're less mindful of how scandalous this song is. For what Mary proclaims in the Magnificat is nothing less than a turning upside down of conventional norms, of all social and economic propriety, of the very powers and principalities that govern the world. E. Stanley Jones, the early 20th century missionary, once said that the Magnificat is the most revolutionary document in the world. It is revolutionary in the way that all political critique is revolutionary. It unmasks the pretenses of false power. It exposes corruption and injustice. It sides unequivocally with the poor and marginalized. It sides with the 99%. Now, I came across an Advent devotional recently, and it said this. But how we've domesticated Mary and Jesus, reduced their powerful words of critique and radical promise to pious platitudes and shallow slogans, void of the costs and the risk, the demands and dangers that genuine discipleship consists of. In the seasons of Advent and Christmas especially, it is so tempting to prefer Mary meek and mild, demure and compliant, kneeling reverently and gracefully in our manger scenes, a posture I've always believed impossible for someone who's just given birth. (laughs) I think about that line now every time I see a manger scene and see Mary kneeling there. The author goes on to say, The sweet, gentle Mary is safe, but this singing Mary is something else. And yet for all the talk of revolution, for all the reversal of fortunes at the heart of Mary's song, we know that we are not talking about a revolution involving political power or military might. The revolution that Mary sings about and that Jesus brings about is one achieved not through the love of power, but through the power of love. It is the cross, God's own act of self-giving, of radical, enemy-loving love that revolutionizes the world now the unwed pregnant teenager singing to her older cousin elizabeth already knows this so much that god's future intentions are proclaimed as already accomplished he has scattered he has brought down he has lifted up he has filled the hungry god's word is as good as done But the author's question to us is this. 
do we believe Mary? We still haven't learned her song. If we really did believe, then preachers wouldn't have to keep ranting at Christmas about consumerism. We wouldn't give in to the culture's push for excess. We wouldn't just pay lip service for Advent. We would be like Mary, preoccupied by other things, by singing for joy and by working for justice, by praising God and by lifting up the poor. Now, concerning the scandal of Mary's pregnancy, Lynn Kohick wrote an article entitled The Real Problem with Mary's Baby Bump. She said, at Christmas, we're used to hearing sermons on comparing today's unwed mothers with a well-known one from the ancient Mideast, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Reflecting on the alleged public shame Mary endured as an unmarried mom-to-be, we hear the single moms in our midst deserve our special compassion and care. Now, without discounting the crucial need to support single moms and their children, and stand against the shame that our culture can dish out to them. Lynn Koek, Associate Press Professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, suggests a different read of Mary's story. In her 2009 book, Women in the World of the Earliest Christians, Illuminating the Ancient Ways of Life, she researches the historical context of marriage and motherhood in the first century AD. And she believes that Mary did not experience shame during her pregnancy. And her explanation goes like this. Mary was betrothed to Joseph, which was a legally binding arrangement in the Jewish culture. All that awaited the couple was the wedding. If they engaged in sexual intercourse with each other, that was not seen as a violation of any cultural norm. Later rabbinic writings allowed that a future groom who had sexual relations with his bride-to-be at her father's house was not guilty of any immoral behavior. If pregnancy occurred before the wedding, this was not a problem because the parentage of the child was secured. What is shocking is that Mary is pregnant and Joseph knows that he is not the father. The problem is not that a betrothed couple had sex, but that presumably Mary had sex with another man. She committed adultery. This explains Joseph's reaction to divorce her, for that was the legal remedy when faced with infidelity during the betrothal period. And as Matthew tells us, Joseph wanted a quiet, no-fault divorce. In the end, however, Joseph decides against divorce after an angel assures him that Mary is virtuous and the baby is from God. In the, in the story's internal chronology, his decision to divorce and his change of heart are not common knowledge. No one in the village would have suspected that he was not the child's father. He stays with Mary, and thus the child, Jesus, would be considered his son, unless the couple chose to speak about the mysterious work of God in their lives, as portrayed in Matthew and Luke's birth narratives. Those who stress that Mary bore the shame of an illegitimate birth must also wrestle with the portrayal of Mary during Jesus' life and ministry. How would we expect people in the first century to treat a woman who had an illegitimate son? Presumably, in some way, as an outcast, however that might be understood at that time. But Mary participates in social events such as the local wedding in John 2. Servants listen to her, which might imply that she is family or has clout in the group. Either way, it does not seem likely they would pay attention to someone who every guest at the wedding presumably would be ignoring. Again, Mary is described as traveling regularly to the temple. Luke describes a time when Jesus got separated from his parents. In the story, Joseph and Mary are traveling in a group large enough that Jesus' absence was undetected for an entire day. This picture does not suggest that Mary was a social pariah. Instead, these sketches show her participating fully in the social and cultural network of Jewish villages in Galilee and Judea. Finally, Some argue that Matthew, in emphasizing Mary's marginality, 
by, he was emphasizing her marginality by highlighting four immoral women in Jesus' genealogy. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, called the wife of Uriah the Hittite. However, it is arguable that all four have histories of faithfulness in the face of troubles. Tamar is credited with doing the right thing in holding her father-in-law to account for failing to look after her. Ruth is repeatedly praised for her obedience to her mother-in-law and to Boaz. King David took Bathsheba from her home, and the text places no blame on her for his misdeed. Only Rahab is identified as a prostitute, but in saving the Hebrew spies and siding with Israel, she redeemed herself and her family. She is a hero in the story. It remains unclear what motivated Matthew to compose his genealogy as he did, but we, can't, we can rule out the suggestion that the list reinforced Mary's suspected sexual impropriety. Now I want to return to Mary's revolutionary song and close with a very American story. The story of Rip Van Winkle. This story takes place during the American Revolutionary War time. In Australia, we would call Rip a larrikin, uh, a fun-loving but rather shiftless character. George P. Webster set the Washington Irving story to rhyme in an illustrated children's book in 1880. He said, near to the town in a cottage small lived Rip Van Winkle, known to all as a harmless, drinking, shiftless lout who never would work but roamed about, always ready with jest and song, idling, tippling all day long. Now, the adults didn't think much of Rip, but the kids loved him, particularly the boys. He spent his time with his dog and went fishing when he wasn't drinking at the pub. He didn't get along with his wife. The local parson didn't think very much of him. And when he could, he would just take his dog and gun and go up into the hills to get away from it all. One day, he climbed so high and stayed so long that he got lost. He stumbled onto a group of little people. He drank with them and played nine pins and then fell asleep. When he woke up, it was 20 years later. When he went to sleep, George III was king in America. And when he awoke, another George was the first president. The poem says, the revolution had come and passed. Rip slept through a revolution. God is bringing a revolution in our world. Isaiah longed for it. Mary sang about it, and some of us are in danger of sleeping through it. Like Rip Van Winkle, we don't do our share of the work. What is the work of Christmas? Howard Thurman says it like this, and I think Isaiah and Mary would agree. When the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to teach the nations, to bring Christ to all, to make music in the heart. Join with me again in the prayer that I began with. Incarnate God, holding tenderly all things human, you became one of us. Lighten our hearts with Mary's vision of your just mercy, that we may be gentle into joining you in the hard and holy work of releasing peace on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. May we all join in Mary's song and be about the work of Christmas. Amen.